welcome to our very first ever Bee Yard Sessions. Um, so we're going to start with the basics right now and I am going to show you how we light a smoker. Um, so you're going to want to make sure that you have your hive tool with you so that you can use it instead of sticking your fingers into the flames. Um, we use um, wood shavings if you can see there. We also usually start with a base layer of egg cartons or drink trays or you could use newspaper anything like that we usually use a torch but you can also use a plain old lighter um, so what i'm going to do first is stick some little torn up bits of this tray this cardboardy stuff in there and i also put just a little little sprinkling of shavings in and then you're gonna put your lighter or your torch in and you're going to first pump 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 the bellows really don't be shy get in there let the flames get nice and big then you're going to add some more shavings and pump 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 um, you want to see lots of thick smoke coming out like you can see now and then keep adding and pumping if you're not getting smoke that means you don't have any flames in there and you can relight it we also put a nice layer of grass on top and that keeps the smoke from the smoker from getting too hot and from shooting sparks all over. If you have sparks shooting out of the spout of your smoker, that means that it is running low, getting too hot, and you should probably top it up instead of shooting sparks at your bees. So I found some grass and I'm just gonna put it on top there. Just a nice layer of grass. You can see there's still smoke coming out and that will keep it from shooting sparks as it gets hotter. So there's tons of smoke and I'm just gonna put the lid on nice and tight. And you just wanna keep puffing away as you work so it doesn't go out. All right, I'm, I'm gonna show you guys about how to um, torch hive tools. This is something that as tech transfer, because we're moving around and working with a lot of different beekeepers, this is something that we do often in between each yard and definitely in between each beekeeper. Um, as something that you guys might be doing with, with a smaller number of hives. Um, it's not necessary to, you know, to scrape down your, your hive tools or torch them in between hives. That's, that's maybe a little bit overkill, um, but definitely in between yards it can be helpful. And um, if you are working with other beekeepers, for example, maybe if you have a mentor and you go into their yard or they come into your yard, it's always best to use one of their hive tools. But if you're going to be going into other people's hives, um, definitely torching them in between. So the reason we want to, have to torch the hive tools is because they can carry pieces of wax um, that could contain disease particles that we don't want to be spreading. So in particular AFB um, spores, we don't want to be spreading those from hive to hive and definitely from, from yard to yard. Um, so because the wax can kind of build up on the hive tools, they're pretty clean now because it's the beginning of the spring, um, but usually we would, we would scrape them all down before we torch them. Just because if there's if there's any wax kind of embedded, or sorry, any spores embedded in the wax, you don't really kill them if you burn them off. All right, so this is one of the reasons that we we often have a torch with us. I mean, you can obviously light your smoker with with anything, even a lighter, um, but a torch is very useful because you can torch and, and disinfect your hive tools. Um, if you don't have a torch, you can put them in a, in a lit smoker, um, but you'd obviously have to leave them there for a little bit more time because you, you want to get them hot enough that you're killing anything. Okay, I'm just going to flip them all over and do the other side as well. All right, so they're, they're all torched and ready. If you're doing this on a really hot day, you might want, not want to handle them right away. If you have some water with you for putting out a smoker, you can kind of sprinkle the water over to cool them off a little bit. 
Um, on a day today, it's kind of cooler and there's a nice breeze, so um, not as big of a deal. But um, again, so that's what we would do in between each of our yards uh, to make sure that you're, you're taking all biosecurity precautions and, and not spreading disease among your hives. Today, we're gonna be going through our hives uh, to check a few things. We're going to be treating with Oxytet for AFB prevention. Uh, we're going to be feeding if the bees need it for some of our hives, and we're going to be checking for any dead outs in our hives. We're going to be unwrapping our yard today so that we can go through and do the things we need to do, but we're not going to keep them unwrapped. Uh, it's a little too early still in the spring to keep our hives unwrapped. We want to make sure that they stay warm in these cool evenings and nights that we're having so that they can continue raising their brood and not going through their food too quickly. Okay, so we're going to go through and unwrap our yard. When we're finished, we're going to rewrap again. So I just like to take our insulation off the top and you can pull your cover straight up and over. I like to keep everything in a stack behind just so that it's organized while you're working. And this way you don't have to take out any frames when you're inspecting, you just have to take off that top. All right, I'm gonna show you guys how to put on Oxytet. So Oxytet is one of the, the first treatments that you're gonna be putting on um, in the spring. Ideally, you wanna put Oxytet on kind of as early as you can, um, just because keep in mind, it takes about two weeks or so to do all three treatments, which I'll, I'll go over more in a second. And then there's a four week withdrawal period. So to, you wanna do this early enough because you can't put supers on during the, or until that withdrawal period is over. Um, so you wanna kind of get it on as early as possible. Um, and oxytetracycline or oxytet, this is a preventative treatment for American foul brood or AFB. Um, and so we're gonna do, we're gonna put that treatment on now. So we've kind of pre-mixed this and we've mixed enough for all the colonies in, in a number of our yards, but um, it's a mixture of the oxytet um, chemical itself, which is a powder um, with, with dry powdered sugar. Um, and the way this works is you're gonna put it on the colony, you're gonna put it on the, the frames, on top of the frames at the back of the colony. So this is the front of the colony here. And the bees basically, they don't really like things like dry sugar in their hive usually, so they're gonna pull it down and throw it out the entrance. And in that process, they're gonna kind of spread it over the brood comb um, and that will kind of all come in contact with the, the Oxytet. Um, so you wanna mix it beforehand at the, and you're gonna be using 32 grams per colony. Um, if you only have a few hives, sometimes you can just measure that out and kind of put it in individual containers or bags. Um, but because we're doing a large number of hives, what we usually do is we measure or weigh how much 32 grams is in the same container that we're gonna be using over and over and then leave a mark on it. So you can see the mark there and Kelsey would have made a video earlier showing um, kind of weighing that out and, and putting that mark on it. So, so about there, kind of up to that line. And then again, I'm gonna sprinkle that along the top bars at the back of the hive. And you get to see all the little ghost bees flying away that are covered in powdered sugar. Um, but that's basically what you would do. And so again, the bees are going to, once this is all closed up, they won't be flying out. They'll be pulling that down and out the entrance <clears throat> and spreading the Oxytet that way. And so you're gonna come back and put on this. So this takes three rounds. This is the first round. We'll, you'll put the second round in four to five days after this one. And then the third round, four to five days after that. And then from the, the date that you put in the third or the last treatment is when you'd have to wait four weeks until that withdrawal period is done. Um, so before that, um, ideally you don't um, want to put on any supers. Two more things for Oxytet. Um, one thing, uh, these are all singles and, and all of the colonies in this yard are singles. If you're running doubles, um, you do Oxytet just like normal basically. So you're, you're doing it still on the top at the back. Um, but on the top box. You don't need to um, crack the boxes and do anything in between. It works on the same principle because they're pulling it down to the entrance. Um, they're covering more space, um, but you're still using the, the same amount, the same 32 grams per, per, um, per round and um, put it at the top, on the top box at the back. Um, and the other thing, so this is a colony that, that's doing quite well. There are bees in between kind of, or on all of the frames there. So that's why I kind of put it across all of these, 
these frames. If you open up a hive that has a much smaller cluster, so for example, if the cluster is more over here, you're still putting the same amount of oxytet in, but you don't want to put it across the whole hive because they're less likely to pull the stuff on the corners across. And so that's just going to sit there and harden. Um, so it's better to just kind of sprinkle it out where the brood nest is and where the bees are, um, and they will move that in kind of in the general area where they are. The next time you come back to do round two, um, there's always a chance, especially with smaller colonies, um, that there will be some that's left over that's a little bit hardened. Um, the best thing to do then is to scrape that off before you put the next round on. The other things that you might have going on at the same time as doing this, um, one of them would be emergency feeding. So emergency feeding, there's no issue with doing that at the same time as you're doing oxytet. So if you're using a baggy feeder, for example, you can, you can put the baggy feeder right on top of there. Um, maybe just move it, for example, if it's already there and you want to put the next round so you're not dumping the, the powder into the bag. But other than that, there's no reason why you can't be feeding at the same time. Um, the other thing would be Varroa treatments. So ideally, you don't want to do a Varroa treatment unless you've actually monitored and you've checked um, what your levels are and, and, and it's necessary to monitor. So because of how early you're usually putting on Oxytet, you probably haven't had a chance to monitor yet. Um, so we likely won't do that until a little bit later when, when we're able to do an alcohol wash on the bees. If you have something like a screen bottom board where it's easier to check the, the mite counts earlier on, um, you can kind of go ahead with putting in a strip. A strip isn't going to affect um, any of the, the Oxytet. So, um, Baverol or uh, Apivar or Apistan. If you were going to use formic acid, um, you can't use formic acid with the Oxytet, unfortunately, because of the, um, the fumigant and that, that's in the hive while it's acting. It can harden the Oxytet and, and it kind of crystallizes, and then if it's hard, the bees won't actually move it out of the hive. Um, so if you're going to use something like formic acid, wait until you've done all three treatments, and then there's no problem putting it on during the withdrawal period. You just can't put it on while you're applying the, the powder so that it doesn't harden. Um, but so that's applying Oxytet, and when you're done, you can just close your colony back up, and you're good to go. All right, I'm gonna go over emergency feeding, which is a question that we get a lot um, early in the spring. Obviously, a lot of beekeepers are worried about their hives and, and wondering, you know, should I be out there? Should I be opening them and feeding them? Um, and it's a good question. It's an important question because if the bees don't have enough stores, they will die, unfortunately. So you're doing really good fall feeding. It really diminishes the need for emergency feeding in the spring. And I keep calling it emergency feeding because in general, you don't have to feed colonies in the spring. Um, assuming they were well fed in the, the fall, um, they often have enough resources to get them through until um, there's kind of a, enough nectar coming through. And that's really the point when, when they're okay, when, when nectar is coming in. At least in this area, that's generally when dandelions are starting to bloom. At that point, we kind of think, you know, your colonies have made it through if dandelions have bloomed and, and there's enough nectar coming in. Um, but so the best way to check if they're gonna need to do any spring, if you are gonna need to do any spring feeding, is to just kind of lift the colony from the back. So just kind of lift it with one hand and you get an idea of how much it weighs. This is obviously not um, an exact science. You're just getting a feel for how, how heavy they feel. This colony feels fine. It's got enough weight and it will probably be fine. But let's assume that it was really light. You're lifting it and there's, there's just no weight there. Um, so you can kind of assume that they don't have enough stores. So if you're gonna do emergency feeding, um, there are a number of ways that you can feed the bees the sugar syrup. So some of the ways that you would use in the fall, um, for example, using a barrel feeder or something that the bees need to fly to, aren't always great in the spring. Today is a beautiful, nice day, but a lot of the days are gonna be too cold for them to, to fly. Um, so one way I'll show you is with using a baggy feeder. So as the name implies, you fill a bag, a Ziploc bag with sugar syrup. Um, I've kind of scraped down the top of the hive, but if there's a lot of burr comb, this doesn't work as well, so just make sure you scrape it down. And I could have done a little bit of a better job, but I'm not going to leave it here, so that's okay. You put that bag on top of the colony, and then using a knife, you're going to cut
you obviously don't want it to go all the way through because it will leak into the colony. So you're just putting a few slits in the top of the bag so that the bees can come up and access that. If you are using a um, baggy feeding, in this case we have an inner cover that's actually pretty deep so it's probably not a problem, but generally you're going to need um, a wooden rim to go around because you don't want to put the inner cover on and kind of smash that. So it is an extra piece of equipment you would need, um, but you put the rim on to give it a little bit of space. Um, and then you can put the inner cover back on like that. Um, something to keep in mind with emergency feed, if, you're, if you need to feed bees because they're running out of resources, this is something you're gonna have to continue for the rest of the spring, basically, until there's resources. So obviously they'll take that down and that will, that will get them a little bit of the way there, um, but they're not gonna get anything from the environment. So obviously once that runs out, you need to be on top of it and make sure they have resources until there's enough nectar in the environment. Um, but some other ways that you can feed bees other than using a baggy feeder would be um, a frame feeder works because same idea the bees don't need to fly to get to it So you just you would remove one of the outer frames ideally an empty frame that doesn't have any honey in it um, And then you can put a honey or sorry a frame feeder in there and then you pour the the feed right in there um, And another way for small amounts of feed is is a boardman feeder, which is basically it's a little piece of plastic that you slide into the entrance of the hive and then you can screw a mason jar into it. Because you're feeding for the most part small amounts of sugar, um, it's kind of an easy one to just fill up that jar and then screw it in and everything and, and feed the bees that way. You could also use um, a bucket feeder. So if your inner cover if your inner cover has a hole in the top, um, you can use a, a bucket as well. So you can fill a small bucket with sugar syrup and um, turn it around and, and put it on the hive. Um, and then just keep in mind that if you're using a bucket feeder, you need to put a, an empty brew box around it um, and then put your lid on top of that because you don't want an animal to come in and knock that off to feed on it. Um, so again, those are ways that you can feed bees. The reason that you're feeding bees sugar syrup is because that's, that's their fuel source. That's what they need to survive. If they don't have that, um, they will die, unfortunately. The other thing that you can feed bees though, um, that a lot of people kind of are starting to think about at this time, are pollen patties. Unless you have a specific kind of management, um, for example, if you send bees for pollination, where you need the colonies to be really strong when you, you know, early, early in the year when you're gonna send them out to pollinate, or if you do management like you're selling a very large number of nukes and you're gonna be selling nukes very early in the season. Um, if you're not doing management really in, in one of those ways, we don't usually recommend that you use pollen patties. So pollen patties, unlike um, sugar syrup, that isn't something that the colony needs to survive. Um, the pollen patty is, is basically triggering brood rearing. If you put a pollen patty on, what you're doing is you're ramping up brood production earlier than normal. And remember, there's a limited amount of resources in terms of honey in the hive for that population. So what you might be doing is you might be creating a larger population by feeding them pollen patties that then need to sustain on that amount of resources. So you might have an issue where they, you know, where they boom and you get a bunch of bees and there still isn't nectar sources out there and they end up starving to death because they use up all their resources. So there's that. There's also the fact that they're gonna be trying to swarm earlier than usual because they're a bigger population than you would normally have at that time of year. So overall, it kind of comes with more I would say more disadvantages than advantages. But if you are gonna use one because of one of those types of management, again, the idea is you're putting that in the hive. Um, that protein is gonna be used to raise more brood and you're gonna be putting on a pollen patty um, four to six weeks before you need that, that population to give them time to actually raise more brood um, and for that to actually emerge. So the last thing that we're gonna to do today is clean up the dead outs that we found as we were going through the hives. Make sure you get your dead outs cleaned up early. Um, you don't want to let them sit around and come and be robbed out by other bees. As soon as it's nice and, and the bees start, uh, start flying, they'll find your dead outs and rob it out. And any diseases that are either in your hives, they're going to get transmitted to the other bees. Or if the other bees are coming in to your equipment and they're uh, contaminated with disease, they're going to bring that to your hive. So that's a biosecurity risk. It's definitely something you want to avoid as much as possible. So acting quickly to get your dead outs 
um, cleaned up and uh, away from, from hungry bees is, uh, is a good idea. Um, so I'm not going to spend any time today going through to diagnose why the bees died. Um, if you're looking for help to try to figure out what happened to your bees um, over the winter, there is a spring checklist that Tech Transfer has. It's available on the website um, and we can make sure that the link is in the description of this video. Um, so if your, your bees died and you're looking for help trying to figure out what happened, definitely give that spring checklist um, a check out. If you still can't figure it out, or if you think something maybe suspicious happened, you can definitely give Tech Transfer a call. We're able to sort of walk you through your management strategies and the most common reasons for bee death. So aside from what actually happened to your bees, the fact is, is that it's dead um, and you wanna get it cleaned up. So the first step I like to do when we're cleaning out dead outs is just to scrape all of the extra burr comb away. Um, so all of this here, there's no reason that has to stay um, on your frame. So it's a great time to be able to scrape that off and clean them up um, before you reuse them. So I'll just go ahead and do that now. I don't just want to toss this anywhere in the yard um, it's important uh, for biosecurity again not to leave a bunch of debris around when you're cleaning up your dead outs try to collect all of this garbage in one area either work beside a little garbage or collect it in something like a lid and you can dispose of it later so it's not attracting bees and other creatures like skunks raccoons or anything like that Just going to give the bottom of the frames a scrape down as well. So it's a good idea when you have a dead out, um, don't just take care of the outside of the box, you also want to take a look at what's going on in the frames. Um, so you can see there that's the dead cluster. So I'm just going to brush the bees off the frame. You might notice there's some bees down in the cells here. You don't have to worry about picking any of those bees out. Um, when you give this frame to a new colony, they'll clean it up. Um, so you don't have to worry about making it spick and span. The bees can handle quite a lot of that cleanup. All right, the other thing that I'm looking for when I'm checking over these frames and dusting the bees off is for signs of disease. So before you reuse these frames, you wanna make sure that they're free of diseases um, and anything that's gonna affect your bees um, going forward. So if the bees from this colony died of a disease, you definitely don't wanna introduce that into a new, strong, healthy colony um, and have them die from the same thing. So the one thing that we're especially talking about when, when we're talking about checking frames for disease is American fowl brood. So if you're not familiar with American fowl brood and you have bees, definitely um, do some research and get familiar with it. It's important to be able to identify that in your frames. Um, there's tons of resources about American fowl brood because it's a, it's a pretty serious disease. So it's definitely something you want to take seriously and, and look for. Um, you're checking to see that everything looks fine. There's some dead brood here. Um, so if you find that, what you can do is the ropiness test. So this is something that can be done um, in the fresh stages of American fowl brood infection. So when the, the dying larva or pupa sinks down and gets gooey. All right, so anytime you see something a little gooey looking, like right here, go ahead and stick your twig or toothpick, whatever you have down into it, and pull out slowly. If it's American fowl brood, this goop is going to string out. So as I'm pulling this, you're going to see a long goop, a long line of goop. So that looks fine to me. The other thing you want to check with American fowl brood, as it gets into the later stages of infection, the, the dead larva dries out and actually forms a hard black scale on the bottom of your cell. So you want to check the bottoms of your cell. It can be hard on a frame like this that's so dark. Um, but you want to just check to make sure there's nothing 
Nothing suspicious on the bottom of your cells. If you do have American foul brood scale, it'll be hard. And if you try to remove it, you'll actually break the side of the, so the cell wall because it's adhered to it so strongly. So just give a look over all your frames for, for signs like that. Um, and as long as you're not seeing that, then those frames are gonna be safe to reuse. So you can either put them onto a colony right away. So if you have another alive colony that's nice and strong right now, you can feel free to give this dead out um, to that strong colony. So put it right on top and effectively turn it into a double. Um, if you don't want to combine your colonies, if you don't want to, to turn your, your singles into doubles, then you can store this somewhere else. So I do recommend if you're storing your um, dead out somewhere, it's a good idea to freeze the frames so you're killing um, any little critters, small hive beetle, wax moth, um, anything else that's alive in your, um, in your frame, in, in the wax and, and whatnot. Freeze that so it kills it and then you can store them safely somewhere in a bee tight area. So in a garage uh, away from where mice and bees and, and whatever else can get into them. Um, if, you, if that's not an option for you, you can stack them temporarily in your yard. Just make sure when you stack them up um, that you make sure that it's, it's all sealed up so that the bees can't get into it and rob these boxes out. The last thing there is to do is scrape off your bottom board. Um, so there's a lot of debris here. Um, things like small hive beetle, voles, other critters, um, they're gonna be very attractive to this. So again, make sure you're scraping it in, uh, into a lid or a garbage or some place that you can then dispose of it later. Don't leave it hanging around. So this isn't just a regular bottom board. You can see there's a screen here. Um, so I, I scraped off the top of the screen, but you can tell maybe if I put this into the sun, there's a lot of debris in between the actual bottom part and the screen. Um, I'm gonna take this and stack it somewhere in the yard with all of the other dead out equipment. Um, and then I'll, I'll put this into a burn barrel or a garbage and then we're good to go.